If you enjoy the video, please give it a like. And if you enjoy the channel, go ahead and give it a subscribe. All right, now on to the episode. Before we start, I continued to try and do better and having reviewed my previous video, I realized that my sound gate was set a little too high, which made things a little choppy. Please tell me if this is still a problem in this video. On to the episode. Now, did I give up on My Hero Academia Vigilantes? Nope, I'm still going to continue it, but after having done some thinking, I realized that as Vigilantes is still an ongoing series, there's no technical end in sight, and I don't personally like that, so I decided to do another series simultaneously. Of course, I wasn't sure if this was a good idea or not, so I decided to aim for an easier series to follow. Granted, by easier I really just mean a shorter series, but really, you don't care, because all you need is kill. That was an awful transition, I know. Anyway, we're doing All You Need Is Kill, which has two volumes, so for us means an easy two-parter. Now, All You Need Is Kill it has a very interesting story in the real world, starting off as a light novel, it got turned into a manga, then into a graphic novel, and finally became a full-blown Hollywood movie starring the likes of Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt. Granted, the names mean nothing to me as I don't leave my house, but I do remember enjoying this movie. This movie was honestly a tragedy in a sense, as it was legit pretty good, but flip-flopping between Edge of Tomorrow and All You Need Is Kill is, and even Live, Die, Repeat really just screwed any chance of getting its name out there, becoming a prime example of a marketing failure. With all that said, we're not here to do a movie rundown, we're here to, to go through the manga. The manga was adapted from the light novel through the writings of Ryosuke Takuichi, I think I got that right, and more importantly was drawn by Takeshi Obata, best known for Death Note and Bakuman. What's interesting is that because most of his work has been slice of life-ish, he has really had to have done more action-oriented scenes. So for example, if you've ever read Death Note, really the most action-packed scene was that tennis scene. So I think this series can also be seen as some kind of artistic training for him. By the way, let's jump into this loot world of All You Need Is Kill. So straight up, we do get a massive exposition dump. Our protagonist is Keiji Korea who had just woken up from his nap, finding himself in the bottom bunk of a bed, revealing that he is indeed a military man. More specifically, we find out that KG is a soldier for the 17th Company, a military unit comprised of many nations' armies as we as a planet have finally been able to unite, under the threat of course of a bigger danger in the form of mimics. Mimics are these floating mounts. I don't really know if all mimics are necessarily floating mounts, but at this point we really only see that design, so maybe that's something we can only really find out in Volume 2. Either way, we see KG being told by one of his fellow soldiers that the big day is tomorrow, where they will have to go out and fight the incoming horde. They then go about their day, but KG seems to be getting these flashes of memories, where things seem familiar, but he's not really sure why. It's the little things, like how he felt like he read a passage in his book already, or the food that he's eating at the cafeteria seems familiar. He ends up spending his last day prepping for the next one. They go through military exercises, and during that, he comes face to face with a living legend, the bitch of the battlefield, Rita Ver... Ver Vratraski? Nailed it. The premier fighter that the world has to offer against the alien threat. Although considered the ultimate warrior, her appearance is that of a petite woman. Roughly the third of the height of any other soldier and at least 80 pounds lighter than the next lightest. The two make eye contact, but nothing really comes out of it. Come the big day, KG suits up in the super suits that for some reason only Japan is able to create. Probably for the plot's sake, but what do I know? The suit is interesting. It looks a little bit like the Halo old ST suits, if any of you have ever played that game. It's that Halo game where you don't get to play as Master Chief, but instead these elite but not overpowered soldiers. Back to the story, KG and his platoon is getting thrashed, and he watches one fellow soldier after fellow soldier go down and slowly, it becomes obvious that his time has also come when he gets shot by one of the spikes that Mimics can fire out, essentially ripping through his shoulder. As things go black for him, we find that he wakes up in the same pose that he woke up at the beginning of the chapter, in the bottom bunk of a bed. Confused, he finds that some of the details are repeating, but refusing to be thrown into the battlefield again, he finds a way to get off base and tries to run, but soon comes face to face with a wandering Mimic, who kills him. Again, he wakes up in his bed, this time he's had it, he borrows a gun, from one of his teammates and blows his brains out, but he wakes up in the bed again. It slowly becomes obvious to him that my boy is having his own case of Groundhog Day, where he is reliving the same day over and over again. The details differ slightly, but the overarching checkpoints remain the same. He makes it further in the battlefield day on some iterations and it gets killed quicker on others. At a point he realizes that blindly going through it will mentally break him before anything, so he aims towards seeing how he can make it through what should be a sure death scenario. 
He starts by training his body and speaks to the platoon leader. The platoon leader advises him that the most important element is battle experience. And Keiji realizes that with him being in a time loop, there is no better chance to gain battle experience. Sort of like grinding, you know, in, a, in video game terms. Bit by bit, he improves himself. He looks into what makes Rita such a force on the battlefield and finds that she uses a specialized axe. So he spends one time loop working out how he can gain access to a similar weapon. After dozens and dozens, hundreds upon hundreds of loops, we visibly see Keiji making progress, pushing his life by minutes every time until he finally starts becoming another leading force on the battlefield, the kind of guy other people rally around and starts pushing back the mimics. Finally, he breaks through and reaches another area where Rita is also cleaning house. There, Rita asks Keiji, how many loops does this make? Man, guys, what a chilling line and what an effective way to cap off the volume. Not only does it mean that Rita knows about the looping, we can also deduce that she herself is a beast because she went through something similar. It also brings up so many questions. Oh, so good. That said, that does bring an end to this volume, and damn, was this a good volume. It's short, really, but it's strange knowing that there's only one single volume left because it feels like there's a lot of potential for expansion. But at the same time, I feel like a series knowing when to begin and when to end is also commendable. So I hope you'll come back in a week or so for part 2 and the finale of All You Need Is Kill. That's all from me, you want from Manga for Dummies, and I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you want more like it, you'll soon see part 2 of this, or you can have a taste of another series I'm covering, My Hero Academia Vigilantes, whose playlist should be placed around here somewhere right about now. And we are back. To cap off, all you need is kill. Once this is done, I'll also release a special combined video so they can go through the entire story in a single sitting, probably around a week from now. Anyway, when we were last on All You Need, we found out that Rita knows a little something something about the whole looping scenario, but before we can really dive into that, we need to revisit chapter 1. We have to remember that from the get-go, Keiji felt that things were a little off. Events felt similar to him, but he couldn't quite put a finger on why. It is only after a few tries that he realizes that he was looping, but able to carry over memories from the last iteration. What I'm trying to get at is that we realize that for him to have felt a little sensation of a loop from the beginning would mean that the first quote-unquote life in chapter 1 was at the very least his second overall loop. I hope I'm making sense, but what KG does is that he takes a marker at the beginning of every new loop and to write a number on his hand, that number being the nth loop. So if we see 3, we know it's his third go, if we see 100, it's his 100th try. But the question becomes, what happened in loop 1? And for that we did get an answer in volume 1, but as I felt it would complicate the story then, I didn't really talk about it yet. But it turns out that in his very first life, KG had had his journey end much like the first few hundred, dead on the battlefield. But as he was dying and feeling his life seep away, he was actually found by Rita who promised to watch over his last moments. It's hard to know if there's really something more to this initial encounter, but if we combine the knowledge that we obtain at the end of Volume 1, perhaps Rita does have something to do with the entire looping situation. That said, while we've talked a lot about the events around Rita, we still don't know much about Rita herself, so let's start with a little character introduction for her. Essentially, Rita was an average girl coming from a small town somewhere in Illinois. For the most part, she wasn't really anything extraordinary, nor did she come from any special bloodline or anything, as is common in manga. Her dad was a former soldier, at least it's hinted at, but he wasn't anything particularly special. For those who've seen Goblin Slayer, the protagonist from that story shares a similar origin story to Rita, as the two watched their little town being decimated by the monsters of the series. For the Goblin Slayer, it was the attack of the goblins, while for Rita, it was the invasion of the mimics. This was particularly brutal for Rita, who was still a young girl at the time, as she watched both parents die in front of her eyes. The death of her father resonated especially as he died protecting her with his last words being, you must survive. Her entire town was decimated and as far as I know, she was the only survivor among 1,500 dead. She would vow to spend the rest of her life fighting the mimics, with one final plot twist being that Rita had stolen the identity of somebody older than her to join the army, meaning that A, part of the reason why she looks so small to begin with is because she's younger than most soldiers, and B, even the name Rita is not her own. In the UDF, which is the official name of the sort of coalition of all these armies that fight against these mimics, Rita had someone who played a similar role of a hero of the battlefield that she does today, that being Arthur Hendricks. After a short interaction with him on the battlefield, she comes face to face with a mimic that seems slightly off to her. But a special mimic is still a mimic, so Rita kills it, but instead finds herself in the showers 30 hours prior. Much like Keiji would eventually, Rita is stuck in a loop. 
What differs from Rita and Keiji though is that while Keiji's loop would restart whenever he dies, Rita's loop cycles whenever she kills that special mimic and that mimic seems to be more troublesome to deal with every time by some increment, either having more allies with that at all times or being more powerful. Rita also realized that mimics were becoming smarter with each subsequent loop as much like how Keiji would improve himself after each run, these mimics were beginning to memorize the movement of its prey, which is us humans. We do get the reason behind the loops, at least Rita's loops explain. Essentially of all the mimics, a few mimics with little antennas are special as they do not specialize in combat but instead serves as a backup drive to every other mimic in the vicinity. As such whenever that save mimic as I'll call it, dies the universe sort of reloads to the last save, thus causing a loop. There's some additional explanation with some invented scientific mumbo jumbo with tachyon particles, but that's made up science, so I won't go too deep into that. But if we understand this concept, Rita has to make sure to be able to do two things. The first is to destroy the little antenna that the save mimic has, so it can't sort of keep sending and re receiving data and signals. And the second is to leave that very same mimic for last after killing every other mimic. However, to be able to kill every other mimic would mean having to plow through dozens if not hundreds of monsters and even though Rita can now physically do it, she just couldn't carry enough ammo on her to get the job done. As such, she went and worked together with the engineer of the base that we met in Volume 1 to develop this gigantic axe that wouldn't require ammo while also having enough power to kill a mimic, the very same that Akiji would eventually base his weapon off of. After formulating a game plan and preparing the proper equipment, Rita sets off for her 211th time and succeeds but finds that the person she had originally looked up to, Andrew, died in that loop, something he had never done in any prior, and because the entire looping situation had finally ended, there's no more chance for Rita to go get that elusive, perfect run where nobody dies. One thing that I sort of skimmed over was how relationships have become essentially impossible for these loopers. Imagine this, you are best friends with someone for 15 plus years, but one day he or she hits his or her head on a telephone pole and all of a sudden your friendship resets back to zero. They've completely forgotten all the good days and all the bad days that they spent with you and have returned to being strangers. These loopers suffer something similar but on a longer time scale. There's no point really trying to be friends with anybody if at any minute when you head into the next loop that person will go back to being a stranger. Even at the beginning of the series, Rita has always been portrayed as a rather distant person as she goes out of her way to not make relationships. When she finally met a fellow looper in KG, she literally breaks down crying because she has finally found somebody that she can share her pains and troubles with and thus the two share a bond, the likes of which no one else can quite comprehend unless a new looper of course gets introduced. That said, the two end up working well on the battlefield because the two have spent hundreds of lives learning how to kill as many mimics as possible essentially becoming two killing machines. It turns out that Keiji had accidentally killed the save mimic in his first run right before Rita could which threw him into the whole looping thing. Granted I do think that it is a little bit strange that the entire quick save slash quick low characteristics hasn't been explained fully to every member of the army since there was a panel showing that uh, Rita had communicated that with the higher ups to be a little strange. You know this is some rather big news and if I was a soldier I would have liked to know what to do. But that said, the two can now work together to try to escape these never ending loops. Rita teaches KG the method that she used to escape her first loop, but when the two work together to pull it off, KG finds that he had reset again, meaning the conditions to his escape is different from hers. So KG is still looping, but as he remembers some of her quirks from previous incarnations, that makes it easy for him to get close to her with each go. The two share some rather sentimental moments, but on the battlefield, Rita shares that she believes that the reason why loops are still occurring when they were doing everything right is that due to them having gone through so many loops already, their brains have morphed and adapted to become what are essentially safe files for the mimics, so as long as the two still live, neither can get out. On the other hand, if Keiji dies, Rita can escape the loop, and if Rita dies, Keiji has an out. Rita and Keiji decide to fight it out, with that realization pushing both forward, KG does end up landing a killing blow and at least for me it felt like Rita could have been pulling her punches. I say this because we know she has more combat experience having went through 200 plus loops while KG was in the ballpark of 150. Another thing that I can totally see is Rita being done with all this as she's experienced everything KG had went through and more. But that she kept herself going mainly because she knew she was the only one that could fight the mimics back. Now comes KG who was actually able to fill in her shoes. At the end of the day, because KG had watched Rita fight hundreds of times in order to learn how to improve himself, he could sort of instinctually feel all the moves that Rita would go for and act appropriately, while Rita had no real prior knowledge as to what KG can do. 
As Rita was waiting to die, Keiji did float the idea of just continue looping as he didn't want to lose Rita. But Rita knew from experience of loving someone and having someone love you back, then having to watch that same person forget that relationship in the next life, just so that you can do it all over again is both mentally taxing and sort of soul crushing. So she does decide to let go, but not before telling Keiji to live on much like her own father did so many years ago. The story concludes with Keiji becoming a type of war hero, but feels empty having lost the only person who he could ever love and who could ever love him. The ending is honestly a little bit bittersweet. I could see how some people would be a little bit angry about this ending as it's not anything satisfying, but at the same time not every ending has to be a happy one. And that, my friends, is the end of All You Need Is Killed. Some quick thoughts right off the bat. I enjoyed this. This was short, but it felt succinct, having hit every major point that I felt were the most important. Sure, there was some questions left unanswered, but let's be honest, if you can suspend disbelief when hearing about time loops, you can probably look over some of the other mysteries left unsolved. The relationship between Rita and Keiji was interesting. It didn't necessarily feel the most natural, which makes sense the context of the premise, but was acceptable nonetheless. The art was actually really good and a major deviation from Obata's usual fare with this being definitely more action oriented. The adaptation as a whole was fairly good as at no points I felt this was something half baked and similarly its length meant that it didn't overstay its welcome to the point where that respect for the series becomes disdain. Overall I'm glad this was our first completed series. I wouldn't go as far as to say that all you need is kill is a must read but it's like 14 chapters so if you have an hour or so to kill why not this is all you need. Thanks for watching everybody, I'll be starting My Hero Academia Vigilantes back up and a long stitched together video combining both parts of All You Need Is Kill will come out in a week or so. This has been Yuan from Manga for Dummies and I'd appreciate any combination of like, comments and subscribes. Alright, thanks dummies, Yuan out.